Well, um, welcome everybody. This is our way. Said, excuse me a moment. Just one moment. Do you want me to start recording? I have already. Oh, sorry. I thought I was recording it. Okay. No, all right. Got it. Yeah. We're doing everything else. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> welcome everybody. Um, many faces I know and names I know and many I don't. Um, we thought we would do this, and I might say we've got nearly a thousand people registered for this lecture. I've got no. Benedict, we've lost you. Turn your sound on. So it was okay. So you can hear me all right? Yes. I don't know why that happened. Okay, so I was just say welcome again. I don't know when my sound got turned off. Um, so welcome. And what we were going to do, as Darren described to you just before we started, is that if you have a question, type it in the chat box. She's going to monitor that. After the lecture, we'll go to a Q&A and Darren will select your questions and read them out and I'll try and answer them. I may not be able to answer them, but at least, you know, we can table the questions. Thank you all for uh, coming. It's been a fantastic response to um, this lecture. It's a lecture I love doing. I haven't done it for many years. And of course, one's always reworking the material, but we wanted to do something because it's just the end of, I think what would also was a fairly extraordinary year. And we wanted to say thank you to our community that has given us so much support in this year. And we've tried to support you back. So it was sort of like a, a coming together with a, a Christmas type topic and hopefully that you'll enjoy it. So I'm going to upload my PowerPoint. Darren, do you want to say anything while I'm uploading PowerPoints, et cetera? Yes, I just wanted to say thank you all for coming. It's just wonderful to see you all here from a very broad, diverse background, but all interested in this topic, which is very, very current and very visible in the sky at the moment. So um, uh, it's going to be an absolutely joyful hour that we've got ahead of us. And um, I hope you all enjoy it. And as I said, put comments and chats in, chat in the chat box and questions, which I will gather, and then I will forward them, feed them through to Bernadette in the Q&A session. Right, are you seeing that okay, Darren? Yes, we are. Excellent. Okay, so I can't see any chat or anything, so that's all over to you, Darren, and sound, etc. Right, this is going to be fun. I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> it's going to be a bit different. And what we're looking at this afternoon or this evening or this morning, and welcome to New Zealand in the small hours, um, is the cultural astronomy of the Star of Bethlehem. And just this term cultural astronomy, I think is important because it's, it's cultural astronomy is the impact of the sky on human culture. We can put astrology under the umbrella of cultural astronomy, but we can put any sky myths or sky stories also in that, that umbrella. And um, as well as all of film and art and poetry and everything to do with the sky. So it's a very, very broad topic. And as many of you would be aware, it's what Darren and I uh, lecture in at the uh, Trinity St. David's University of Wales. I should have said the University of Wales, Trinity St. David in the MA in cultural astronomy and astrology. That was a plug for the MA, the online MA, which is totally online and is fantastic if you're interested. But addressing the cultural astronomy of the star of Bethlehem. Now, I woke up this morning and opened the paper on my iPad, and there before me was the front page of the Telegraph, for those, this is in the UK, and in the bottom corner here was actually a story about, or a little headline, Star of Bethlehem to appear after 800 years. I thought, what, 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 what? So, I read the article, of course, or read it the little bit. This was a, a blow up on it. And it is obviously talking about the, the forthcoming or the coming uh, Jupiter-Saturn conjunction that we are, if you are lucky enough um, to have a cloudless night, you'll start to see it or you would be seeing it already in the West just after sunset. And they make the statement that this is sort of the combination that um, precipitated the Star of Bethlehem. So. 
And to be honest, um, this particular conjunction that we're seeing, which is this is how it looks, this is going how it's going to look on the 21st. Um, so it is the, the two planets come exactly over top of each other. So they will be a nice bright thing in the sky. And it's going to look gorgeous. And um, I doubt if I'm, we're going to see it because of the cloud cover uh, that's over the UK at the moment. But um, what's important to recognize is that it's not, it, it's a bright light in the sky, but it's not the star of Bethlehem. It is something that's similar to it. But then again, I think after the year we've all had, a little hope in such a story as this could go down quite well. So there's not much good cheer about Christmas at the moment. So if we get a pseudo star of Bethlehem, that's well and good. But let's actually start with um, our story. And the, the primary sources for the star of Bethlehem are, of course, the two gospels one of Luke and one of Matthew. And the one of Luke, which is this one, these are Bernati's, um, sorry, Giotto's, Bernati's, Giotto's images, which I'll talk more about a little later on. But this is the one of Luke. And Luke is the story, his gospel is the story of the shepherds in the field at night. The big light happens in the sky. An angel tells them that the Messiah has been born. They rush off down to Bethlehem to look for the Messiah. They find Mary in a stable because she couldn't get room at the inn and Christ is born in a stable and they get really excited um, and then they rush off to tell the world that the Messiah has been born. Meanwhile, Mary and Joseph get a little bit concerned at all the hype that's going on. Uh, Darren, could you turn off that microphone wherever it is, please? A little bit of concern about all the hype that's going on and um, decide they better get out of town. So this is this story, and we're not going to address this. It's a fascinating story. It happens on the night of Christ's birth, and immediately this is interesting because we get this great figure being born in the nighttime rather than the normal knee-jerk things to have great figures born in the daytime not going to address Luke, haven't got time to address Luke, but I will at the end of this lecture point you to a paper I've written on both of these stories, which does look at unpacking Luke in the cultural astronomy and what's contained there. What we're going to do today is we're going to work with Matthew's pericope, and that is the story of the Star of Bethlehem. It's an utterly different story. It has almost no connection whatsoever with Luke's, um, except the Christ figure is in it, but it's a totally different sort of structure. And this is um, Giotto's painting. We can see the star here represented as a comet. So I'm behind myself, however, because we can't start with the Gospel of Matthew. We can't start there because the Gospel of Matthew comes into an already ripe situation. So let's just have a little bit of a look at this ripe situation. Well before the time of Christ, there were prophecies about the birth of a Jewish Messiah or a Jewish king. Um, we get the prophecy of Balaam, which talks of a star shall come forth out of Jacob and, this, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. And here's an illustration of that situation. And then there's also an earlier prophecy of Mirach um, from around about 750 BCE. And it simply states that there will be born in Bethlehem um, a ruler of, the, of Israel will come forth. So this is the, this is the uh, nuance that's here uh, before we actually get the events which Matthew links to Christ's birth. So let's now actually step in and actually have a look at Matthew's gospel, um, recognizing that he would be aware of these two prophecies. So he starts his gospel, and it's two, Matthew 2, 1 to 11. He starts his gospel with immediately placing Jesus' birth in Bethlehem. Without offending anybody, Jesus may not have been born anywhere near Bethlehem, but it suits the whole situation to locate this important figure being born in Bethlehem, which ticks the box of one of the prophecies. So that's a key thing to remember. And Matthew says, Jesus was born in Bethlehem in the days of Herod the king. Behold, 
wise men from the east come to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and we have come to worship him. <clears throat> now, Herod is disturbed by this because Herod doesn't want the um, uh, a new king being born anywhere. I mean, Herod has already murdered his wife and his son. Um, he's gone quite crazy by this stage. Um, so he's not going to be overly excited by the news. But anyway, he says to the so-called uh, Magi, the three wise men or the wise men, that the child would have to be born in Bethlehem because this is where the prophecy says, but could they hive off to Bethlehem, please find the child, tell him where the child is, and then he would be able to come and adore the child. So the important part um, that we gain from this little bit of the gospel is that Christ is born before the death of Herod, according to Matthew, locating him in this prophecy. And Herod is generally agreed, Herod died around about 4 BC. So if we're going to look for any sky events whatsoever, we're going to take that approach to this or we could just think the whole thing was a miracle and had nothing to do with the sky and that would be the end of the lecture and we all just go home but let's just acknowledge that but move on from that position and say right oh we're going to look for a sky event and it has to be before 4 bc so we don't want it sort of at 15 bc we sort of want it in the last few years of herald's reign we get that sort of sense so that gives us a, a time marker Going back to Matthew's gospel, then we actually have that Herod summoned the wise man secretly. There's an element of secretness around this, and it's a little bit unclear as precisely what that is. And he asked them when the star did appear. We don't get found, uh, we don't get told the answer. He then tells them to go to Bethlehem and come back and tell him where the child is, as I've already said. And when they heard the king, they went their way, and lo, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came to rest over the place where the child was. These very famous lines in Matthew. And then Matthew continues, going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. They offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So what's important here is the kings, the three kings, and the gospel doesn't say there's three, by the way, but we'll just say three kings for the sake of the argument. The kings do not go into a stable, they go into a house. And the gifts that they bring the king are the classic Middle Eastern items, which are the gifts to the divine, gold, frankincense and myrrh. So these are the gifts that the gods live on in the Egyptian tradition. These are gifts of sake to a sacred being. And we can see this uh, idea of the, the Magi going to a house. So this is well past Luke's gospel. Um, the child, this isn't the night that Christ is born. This is sometime later when they catch up with him. Mary and Joseph are in a house and they find Mary in the house and Christ is a small child baby on her lap. And here they are clearly in these two medieval pieces. Um, they're uh, located in a house. Now, Matthew continues the story. What actually happens is the three wise men or the wise men leave, just disappear. They just they have a dream. They decide they're not going to go back and tell Herod where um, the child is. So they sort of just disappear. Then um, Matthew goes on, and this is 16 to 18, and he writes that Herod becomes filled with rage about the birth of the new king, and he doesn't want, um, he hasn't got any information from the Magi. All he knows that from them is that the king has been born. So he orders the massacre of all the two-year-old male infants, two years or younger, um, in Bethlehem. There's no real historical evidence for that massacre, but there's um, it, it's well documented, you know, within the biblical sense. And if that massacre was valid, it's a very important event in this regard, because if if a king comes along and massacres all your children, 
in your town or community, it sort of sticks in people's mind. Um, so we can actually think of this massacre as embedding the story into the Jewish community's um, oral history. Uh, and in that sense, you know, the, the children get massacred because Herod thinks there's a king there, because the prophecy is being fulfilled. And that makes it newsworthy. It makes it stickable. It makes it an important piece of oral history being passed along. And I believe it becomes the seed uh, for Matthew's later gospel. Now, Matthew then writes his gospel, which we've looked at. And everything, you know, Christianity is trying to get a foothold in the world and trying to get established as a major religion. And along comes St. Ignatius. And St. Ignatius is writing some 50 years after Christ's death. So he's only just a little bit past the event. So he's still in that cultural milieu. And he hears the stories or takes the story from Matthew and embellishes it, doesn't embellish the gospel, but redefines the Star of Bethlehem. Indeed, what he actually does is he creates the narrative of the Star of Bethlehem. And he says that it's that it's a star like no other star, that it rises and it outshines the sun and it outshines the moon and it outshines all the other stars in the sky, all putting them together. So this is something blinding. This is incredible. And the point is what Ignatius is trying to do is he's trying to show that the birth of Christ raises people above the fate of the world, above the fate of magic and astrology, etc., to break free of one's planetary fate, to actually then become free in becoming a Christian, that type of narrative. So he wants something that's going to be better than the planets, better than the astrologers. The astrologers are very powerful, remember. So he's, this is a power struggle. So he says, our star, this one that happened back then, is massive and it totally outshines even the sun. So in a sense, Ignatius creates the idea in our head of the star of Bethlehem. And with that implanted into and linked to the birth of Christ, it's stayed there ever since. And the question naturally arises very quickly, like what did people see? What was it in the sky? Was it really, if it's so big, what could it be? And 150 years later, um, Origins talks of it being a comet. It's the only thing he can think of that could be like what Ignatius was talking about um, was a comet. And this has real stickability. This is an idea that really takes hold because comets can be quite random um, and they can be quite spectacular. So maybe it's a comet and it's a, an idea that we still have today. Um, we see it reflected, here's uh, Giotto's work again, and we see it reflected here in the medieval period, the 1300s, as a comet. And indeed, from the time of origins right through to the medieval period, right through until this man, it stays as the idea of a comet. So we have a comet and then Kepler comes along. Kepler gave us the laws of planetary movement. Before Kepler, we could never figure out where Mars was really. It was always just a rough approach. Um, and he worked for years and years and years. He was like a human computer. Um, calculating the planetary movements and then finally working out the laws of the planetary movement. M massive achievement. And because of this, he also noticed something really quite important. He noticed in his time, about 1604, a really, really rare alignment of the three visible planets, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn. And he worked out then that this could also have been happening around the time of Christ. So he put forward a different idea and he said, hang on, it might not be a comet. It could have been caused by this rare triple conjunction of Mars, Jupiter and Saturn. And in 1604, he had observed it. Here it is here, this is September, October, 1604. And at the same time, he had observed a supernova, which he recorded. So for him, 
there was a simple logic here. First of all, using his amazing skills, he worked out that this particular combination would only happen every 796.4 years. And working backwards from where he was, he worked out that it occurred in 7 or 6 BCE. And that alerted him. He thought, God, golly, could this be something to do with the birth of Christ? But he hypothesized that this wasn't the star of Bethlehem because this couldn't be bright enough. This couldn't fulfill Ignatius's um, description. And so he suggested that the star, that this clustering of three planets caused a supernova, their gravitational pull in some way caused a supernova to happen. And it would have been the supernova that was the star. This little rider part of Kepler's thinking gets overlooked uh, and people now just think, oh, let's just go for a Jupiter-Saturn conjunction, um, which is sort of not quite what Kep Kepler was talking about, because the truth is, this is the triple lineup or the alignment of Jupiter, Saturn and Mars in January of 06 BCE. Um, and they do get a bit tighter than this, but this is not uh, a star. This is this is not um, is it's not a bright star in the sky. So it does only happen every once every seven hundred and ninety six point four years. Granted, so it's rare. It will again for those of you who are interested. It will happen in the middle of May two thousand four hundred eighteen CE. So about. 400 years time, it will happen again. And you can bet your bottom dollar when it does happen then, that astrologers then will be very excited by it, will see it as quite important because it's such a rare thing. And more than likely, it would have been the astrologers back then would also think of it as something very, very important because they might not have known that it was only every 800 years or so roughly, but they would have been aware that they hadn't seen it before. So where does this leave us? We know that this coming together of these three outer planets, the, the three superior planets they're called, these are the three visible planets, the other two are inferior, that's Mercury and Venus, always tied to the sun, but Mars, Jupiter and Saturn can, are not tied to the sun, so they were considered the three uh, and now after that, there was nothing was visible. So they're considered the three most important planets. We know that Jupiter and Saturn come together every 20 years. We know that even if there's a third one coming together, it's not going to be a bright star. But if we're looking for bright, spectacular event, um, yes, we can say it's it's not spectacular. It is beautiful. But when we when we look at it, we've got to ask another question. The researchers in trying to track down the star of Bethlehem, they, they tend to buy into a narrative that it has to be a visually spectacular sky event. Um, because for them, what's happening, what is spectacular in the sky has to be something big and bright. And it, it leads us down the wrong pathway and deeply enhanced by St. Ignatius. But we can ask the question spectacular in whose eyes? And if we want to think about spectacular in whose eyes, we've got to think it's got to be spectacular in the eyes of the Magi or spectacular in the cultural astronomy time of that period, of in that, in that period of around about the early years BC, the late years, I should say. So if we go hunting for spectacular visual in the sky, we might be looking in the wrong place. And what we've got to do is we've got to think about what is spectacular for these travellers called the Magi who came to town seeing it. What was, what was floating their boat? What was going on for them? So let's look at these kings bearing gifts. Who are the Magi? What's going on here? Well, we know that they are sky watchers. The Magi were Zero, uh, Zoroastrian priests of the religion of Western Iran or Persia, as it was known then. They were skilled, very skilled in astronomy, astrology. There was no division. There was no difference between those two 
back then. So they're skilled in sky watching and understanding cycles, alchemy and mathematics. They were considered by the Greeks um, as to be the Chaldeans and the founders of astrology. And the Greeks weren't necessarily correct in that, but they're strongly associated with astrological law. And Herodotus identified them as interpreters of omens and dreams. They were uh, associated, their very name was associated with astrology and sky events. So it's not unusual that they would actually follow this rare superior planet alignment, following or heralding the sun in their astrological spectacular event. This would have been absolutely spectacular as far as they are concerned. They may not have known that it was an 800 year cycle, but they would have known that they hadn't seen it before. And they would have known that something big was afoot. So this is pretty spectacular from their point of view. The sky for them, as the sky for everybody in that period of time, was ensouled, alive, full of omens and prophecy. The astrology of the day placed importance on planets that rose or set with the sun or moon. The sun or moon was the powerhouse of the whole system and planets rising or setting around them contributed to that powerhouse, helped them in some way. So the planets that clustered around the lights were known as spear bearers in the Hellenistic tradition. That's why I put a few Persian spear bearers here. And if the spear bearers clustered together, Ptolemy wrote, and he was writing uh, maybe about 50 to 80 years after these events. So he's, he's in that same period of time. He called them, if they came together, he called them a Dori Fori. You don't have to remember that name. Um, it's not important. It's just showing that there was an acknowledgement that if they came together, something important was going on. And he made the case that if the, the spear bearers and the dory fori, that the, the larger the number of them, the greater the birth, the more famous the person, more powerful the birth. And that when this happened, when these spear bearers came together, they would give gifts to the sun, or they could give it to the moon as well, but they would give gifts to the sun. Um, so this was very powerful. To have one of the spear bearers, to have one of the superior planets was great. To have two, like we're having at the moment, that's terrific. To have three was, oh, my God, this doesn't ever happen. So to put it mildly, if we ask what was spectacular for the astrologers of the day, firstly, just to sort of put a little bracket around this, the inferior planets of Mercury or Venus are not very powerful in terms of spear bearing because they're always close to the sun. They can, they're always above it or below it. In the, you either see them in the evening or in the morning. However, within the astrological law, if any of the superior planets were involved in the Dori Fori, it was a mark of fame in a chart. To have all three planets marked, hang on, I've just got to close the door. Sorry, people, to have all three planets in the Dori Fori was a mark of truly astounding greatness. There's, this just couldn't even think of a, a similar situation, except maybe, maybe it would be so great. It would be like Sirius the Great, 500 years earlier, the great Persian king. No one had a chart for him, but, you know, there is this idea that you could get a king of kings. And since you never get these three planets coming together, as far as people know, then this would be a king of kings. So this is a spectacular event. I've just got, Darren, could you do something about the dogs, please? Sorry, people. Okay. So we've got this spectacular event. And let's look at these gift giving wise men. The wise men, the kings who announce the birth of the king, bring him gifts. 
Matthew's gospel tells us that the Magi gives gifts to the newborn king. We know that. But we also know from the astrology writings of the day that the three superior planets also give gifts to the new king. So a logical question is, who are these magi? Because are they really humans or are they planets? And indeed, if we pause here for a moment and think, if you were going to go and announce the birth of a new king, you'd hardly go to the current king who was renowned to have already murdered his wife and son because he's paranoid and tell him a new king's been born. So this is not really sensible behaviour if you were three travelling magi. Additionally, at that time, Rome was a bit stroppy about astrologers. They were in a power struggle with their own emperors and astrologers. Um, so you just wouldn't go prouncing around the countryside, um, stressing that you had seen an astrological prediction and that a new king had been born to the paranoid old king. So there's a certain, th these wise men are either not too wise, pretty stupid, or they're not physical human beings at all. So let's now just step back. Let's go back and look at what was going on in the sky and what the sky watchers in Jerusalem would have seen. Here we've got um, a map and here we've got Jerusalem and here we've got Bethlehem. They're about eight miles apart. This is a reconstruction of the um, the Temple of the Mount. And standing here, or standing any place really, but standing here, looking in this direction, you would actually have a very clear view of the whole 360 degrees of the area. And you'd be looking down towards Bethlehem. And indeed with a little bit of technical help from Google Earth, this is the view from the Temple Mount looking south towards Bethlehem. So you see you have a very clear view of the sky. And indeed, Bethlehem is about eight miles in this direction, roughly in this area here. We can zoom in a little bit on this or focus a little bit more on it and go to a construction like this. This is a 360 degree panorama of the surrounding landscape. As you stand there, what it looks like. It is has been magnified. So it's slightly exaggerated in that regard. But this is, you can see a very, very clear view. This line here, I've put this line here, is exactly where Bethlehem would be if you were standing on the Temple Mount. And clicking on that line, we actually can get a cross section of the landscape between the viewer and Bethlehem. And we can see that from standing on the Temple Mount, you can actually see for 16 miles in this direction. So these distant peaks here are 16 miles away. So Bethlehem is around here, eight miles. So Bethlehem would be around here somewhere. So you're gonna get a clear view of Bethlehem without any doubt whatsoever. So we can see that the view is gonna happen and you can see that I'm, I'm taking the perspective of standing on the Temple Mount. Okay. So let's now look at this. Let's, let's see if we can reconstruct these skies and just see what's going on. What would the priest standing here had actually seen? And we're just going to sort of have a look between May 07 and May 06. The first thing you would notice if you're one of the priests is standing there looking at this landscape drawing is not necessarily the eastern desert so I apologize for that but if we're looking out but this is actually for the latitude of Jerusalem and looking towards Bethlehem Bethlehem's in this area just here and if we're looking towards the south we would see a Jupiter Saturn coming together now this is interesting but not necessarily worrying in that regard um, the Jupiter Saturn happens every 20 years. They would have been expecting it. They, they know where it's going to be. They understand the cycle um, and they would be watching it. But the thing is, it's it's all fairly straightforward. Nothing, nothing too uh, concerning. And this is what it would look like. Fairly close together in the sky here. And this is in May of 07. That should be 07 BCE, of course. 
okay, so they're watching that. And as they watch it, it's slowly moving closer and closer to sunset. And by the autumn of 07, as they're watching it, they start to note that it's setting just after sunset. So it's over here, low in, in the sky. So it's setting. And they would expect then the Jupiter Saturn to get closer and closer to the sun so it slowly disappears um, and um, becomes invisible. And that would be fine. And that's what they would expect. And once again, it's not alarming. It's not spectacular. It's a visible Jupiter Saturn. And then it disappears for a while. But as they're watching it, something weird really happens, weird from their point of view or spectacular, because what actually happens is the Mars comes hurtling along and starts to join the two planets. And this they've never seen before. This is, although to us it looks quite normal, to them the implications are quite extreme. They're, all three planets are lined up and seen in the west setting just after the sun. So technically, in this poetic astronomy, in this ensouled sky, these three characters are following the sun. They're, they're following the sun as it sets. So this puts them into a bit of high alert. This is something to be anxious about. They're not knowing what an omen it is and it represents, it does represent as far as they're concerned in their astrological law, um, a great birth about to occur. And to complicate the issue because they're looking south and Bethlehem is around here, is all happening in this prophecy potent landscape, a landscape that's already got this efficacy of a prophecy um, in, embedded into it. Now, you know, they could be anywhere in the world and looking south and they would see this, but they're not knowing that. They're here in Jerusalem looking towards the Bethlehem area and they're seeing this combination. So it's only logical, we don't know, but it's only logical they would start to think about these ancient prophecies of a king rising out of Bethlehem. We don't know, we've got no idea. But it, it's not unheard of. The prophecy is there. It's well documented. It's in their writing. These are the scholars of the court. They would know these things. They are watching the sky and they would be aware of the possible combinations. Now, as they watch this and the three planets start to slide in closer to the sun, something else starts to happen or rather has been happening at the same time slot. And that is Venus. Venus has been a bright evening star, rising, sorry, a bright morning star. If this is this is sunset, pretend this is morning, there's a division here. They're not seeing this all in the same sky at the same time. There should be a line down here. Think of it like that. And Venus as a bright morning star is not unusual. We get it happening frequently and it is spectacular and beautiful when you can see it, particularly in the morning because the morning air is so clear. It's just beautiful. But Venus, and most people don't know this, but Venus is a little strange. She moves differently when she's actually at these extremes of being an evening or a morning star. And what Venus does is that generally a planet will go what they call retrograde. It's when it's in a particular relationship to the sun, it will appear to move backwards through the zodiac and then forward again. Um, so most planets would go forward and then backwards and then forward and that's it. But Venus does this weird stuff because Venus can do that, but also Venus can go up and then go way off the ecliptic up and then loop and then come across like that. So she does this, instead of just a nice zigzag, she does this whole loop in the sky. Not all the time, there is a rhythm and a pattern to this, and the rhythm and the pattern repeats only every 243 years. So if you're watching an evening or a morning Venus and you're watching the way it reaches its culmination before the sun comes up and blots it out, if you're watching that and then plotting where it gets to, each morning, if it's a morning Venus, where it gets to. Um, and when you think you've got that figured out, 
then it happens again, you'll find that it'll be different. So you're not going to see the same sort of pattern in the sky uh, for another 243 years. It's not something we worry about in this day and age, but it is a simple fact of the astronomy of the situation. Now, it, it's easy to look at Venus with, in loops like this, but let's actually put it into a landscape. So with Venus's variable retrograde loops, it changes the way that Venus seems to, the star seems to work. So that instead of when a planet rises, it'll rise and be heading towards the south and it'd be a bright Venus and then the sun would come up and it would extinguish. And you would normally just expect the Venus to get there and then maybe get a, get a little less further. It would go up and then come back. That's what it would do. But because of her or Venus's weird retrograde loops, there'll be all sorts of changes to this. And for any given location, she can switch around. I always call her she. She can, she can move around in the landscape. So, for example, you can watch the highest point she gets to before the sun blots out the light. And you might find night after night, if you watch that, that she might suddenly start moving upwards and, and the star might climb higher, going backwards. Or the star could suddenly, the Venus could be there and then start moving back towards the east. Um, going that sideways night after night all of a sudden or Venus could be you could watch it and then it starts to climb dramatically doing a loop this is not all on one night but this is night after night after night if you plot it or alternatively what Venus can do is climb and then stand still and then drop down over the same bearing in the same place in the sky before it moves back and that was exactly what this Venus did as the three planets lined up in the west. Venus rose, and then every night it rose to exactly the same position. It didn't shift its position, it maintained its position, and then slowly, night after night, it simply dropped down on its bearing. And to represent that schematically for you, this is a diagram I've done, and, and this, I've slightly exaggerated it, but this is our landscape. This is Bethlehem. This is looking from the Temple Mount. So Bethlehem's here at a bearing of 203 degrees from the Temple Mount. Um, and all of this is happening to in the southeast. So all of this is happening here. It's not right over Bethlehem. It's about 60 degrees away. 60 degrees away is sort of like, like that much on the horizon when, you, when you're standing at the Temple Mount. Um, so it's just to one side. But it's not, it's not on this side. It's not to the northeast. It's to the southeast. And what happens is Venus started to rise as a bright star. And this is every night. If you think of the highest point it can get before the sunlight blocks it out. And then it just hovers. And then every night it's just getting lower and lower and lower and lower. And then slowly it drops back as the sun catches it up. So we get this amazing event. So what we have we have the three planets, which is spectacular in the astrological use of thinking. And at the same time, we have the three planets and they disappear while this Venus is doing this hovering and hanging. So the three planets are there, then slowly they disappear because they, the sun's gotten closer and closer to them, so they disappear. And they're not there at sunset and they're not there at dawn because they're contained in the sun's light. So they're watching the sky drama because we've got these three characters and then they disappear. And meanwhile, on the other side of the coin in the morning, we've got this morning Venus doing this spectacular thing. They're not really sure what's going on. They keep watching. And about a month later, the three planets appear again. Well, the two planets have appeared, Jupiter and Saturn. Mars is still just down here, and Venus is amongst them. So they're all together there. They've gone. They've disappeared from the west. They've disappeared for a month, and suddenly they've appeared with the star. They've joined the star. And returning to Matthew again, we've got 
that we know that they disappear and then they go into, they find the child, they go into the house, they saw the child would marry his mother, they offer him gifts, gold, frankincense and myrrh. So the kings arrive sometime after Christ's birth, they travel to the house of Mary and Joseph and they find the baby and they give him their gifts, which we've got represented here. So what have we got here, therefore? We've got all these bits and pieces. What have we got? We've got, first of all, we've got the kings or the wise men arrive, labelled as magi, and magi is equivalent to astrology, but also they are the astrological markers of a great birth. So the three kings announce the birth of a king. There they are, announcing the birth of the king. At the same time, by, by itself, the Venus is not, not a spectacular, although it's a beautiful sight, but at the same time, we've got a lovely morning Venus and it just so happens that it's doing one of its weird little retrograde loops where it is actually just hovering and dropping down and in the direction, not exactly over it, but in the direction of Bethlehem. And then what happens? The kings disappear. And then they reappear again now in the house of the sun, the house of the king. And within astrology, when you say that something's in the house of something, rather, you actually mean it's in the same sign. So if something is close together with the sun, it's in the house of the sun. That's the language that's used. So the three kings appear now in the house of the new king. And as the astrology of the day dictates, they have to give the king great gifts, which they do. So rethinking this story, we can hypothesize that the scribes or the priests of Jerusalem could have noted the astrological spectacular clustering of the three superior planets. They are the ones that see it. At some points, it would have been pretty nervy, but at some points, the scribes inform Herod of the threat to his rule. They tell him a great king has been born and he needs to do something about it. And they base their argument in the astrology of the Magi. So who announced the king's birth? The Magi, the planets. The three planets with their worrying implications as far as the priest of Judah are concerned, they disappear. And only after a period of time, they reappear in the east along with the star and in the house of the sun. To this story, the paranoid Herod reacts. He, he gets slightly upset, we could say. And so from the reading of the sky story, he realizes he has to do something. And so what he decides to do is to massacre all the children born in all the male children born in Bethlehem under the age of two years old. Now, if he hadn't done that, then this might have just washed over and been forgotten. But if you stomp into town and kill all the kids, you are going to make a marker in the community's memories. They remember this. This, this action embeds it. It really reminds them that this a Messiah has been born. There was this amazing sky event. The prophecy has been foretold. And this becomes um, in oral history so that in 50 years' time, when Matthew's writing his gospel, he's going to pull all these threads in together, the prophecies and the massacre, and bring them all together. When we, um, so we, we think about um, Matthew and writing the gospels, you can see it makes sense for him to actually link Christ's birth to this there's a funny sound, Darren. Okay, sorry. Um, link Christ's birth to the um, oral narrative of the sky. 
um, marking the the birth of the king and of course the massacre of the on the innocents. It's an extremely logical thing for him to do. Indeed, as I said to you, that Christ may not have been born in Bethlehem at all. But if you can link Christ to Bethlehem, link him to the massacre of the innocents, link him to this sky narrative story, then you are giving your man, your new religion, the best chance of a leg up. 50 years later then, after Matthew's writing, we get Ignatius, and he decides to give it a really big leg up and to break it free of the astrology and to actually make it a brilliant star. So we get the whole myth of this brilliant singular object in the sky. That, of course, then feeds into origins, which I've already pointed out to you, and the idea of the comet. That leads later on to Kepler, but Kepler still keeping still keeping the idea it's got to be a bright star object, points to the three planet conjunction. He's the first one to do this, but says this has caused a supernova. So up until this point, everybody has looked at a bright object in the sky. And indeed, even to this day, everybody still looks for a bright object in the sky. But what I'm suggesting is to come at it as a cultural astronomer and to think that what was the sky law of that period what was spectacular for those people? And as soon as we do that, we can actually see different ideas emerging. We don't have to find a bright object that's spectacular for us. We need to find a spectacular astrological event. And we find it. We find it in the writings of that period, particularly in Ptolemy, but earlier writings of well, where the three planets form this story for you and form this great gift giving, uh, which mark the birth of the greatest of kings, the king of kings, so to speak. So in looking at this, if we're looking at it from a cultural astronomy point of view, then what we've got are these story elements. We've got the arrival of the Magi, and we can think of those as the three superior planets in the West. There's no reason to assume that they're human beings. Indeed, if they're human beings, they're particularly stupid human beings. Right? So let's think of them as the three superior planets, which announce the birth of a great king. We get a bright star in the East, which we know is Venus, and they know it's Venus. There's no great mystery about that. But Venus is gorgeous when she's at her greatest elongation. She really does give, I mean, Venus is the Christmas tree image that you all, that is used for talking about the Star of Bethlehem. And indeed, if you get a good Venus on a clear morning in a dark sky, it does look like that because our eye breaks up the light and does this sort of spiky thing to it. And I personally have seen Venuses like that. They are breathtaking. But we get a Venus like that and the Venus, because of its eccentric or unpredictable retrograde loops, will actually rise. And this one, instead of doing something weird, this one hovers and just drops down. Just so it acts almost like a pointer. We can take that thinking. The Magi disappear. So they secret, according to Matthew, they secretly leave Herod's place. And then then no one to be seen, and then all of a sudden they reappear in the east. They're with the new king, which is exactly what happens. The superior planets are now seen rising in the east just before the sun. And in that regard, they are in the, the house of the sun. This is the astrological term for being in the same zodiac sign as the sun or very close to the sun, and it's called that you would be in the sun's house. House and sign were considered interchangeable in their terminology in that period of time. So they go to the new king's house. And of course, according to the astrology of the day, they are a dory for you, and they must give their divine gifts to the king. And then, like every good planet, they simply disappear. So Matthew has them going off, disappearing, and that's exactly what they would appear to do in terms of they would break apart and continue on in their own orbits. And the whole of this story, the whole of this story gets remembered because of Herod. The whole of this story, I believe, is embedded 
into the collective because of the massacre of the innocents, which means by, by the time Matthew's writing his gospel, it's fresh. It's a story that's rattling around. He's learned it from his father. His father's learned it from his father. And that's about all you have to do. You don't have to go back much far, further than that to know of these stories that are there about. So what do we have? This is what I think we have. The Star of Bethlehem is not a single event. It's the title of a sky story. It's the title of a sky narrative. It's the title to a play that's happening in the sky. And it's a title of a story of planets rising and settings and the comings and goings, which become embedded into the oral history of the community by the action, actions of a ruthless king. So we have the three kings who announced the birth and the star of the hovering Venus. So hopefully um, you have found this useful for your own thinking. It's a way of coming at this story, looking at the, the way the sky was viewed in that period of time and what was important to those people in that period of time. And it makes sense of all of the components. So what we're looking at with the whole narrative is this beautiful sky play, which is using Hellenistic astrology wrapped up in poetic language. If you want um, more on this, I've written a whole paper on it. You'll find it on my Academia EU site, um, The Star of Bethlehem and Luke Shepherds. That's where I also uh, unpack Luke's story, which is another fascinating story. So you can just simply, if you just type in that URL or simply go to academia.edu and type my name, you'll get to this page and you can download that. If you want Christmas reading a little, and that's got all the references and everything there. So I just want to finish this lecture by wishing you all from myself and for Daryl and before we cross to the Q&A, just wishing you all a really, really wonderful solstice, a happy solstice. Um, and I think we all sort of happily bless an ending to 2020. I think it's lovely that the sky is giving us a beautiful Jupiter and Saturn at the moment, not the star of Bethlehem, of course, but uh, and as I said right at the beginning, anything that gives the world a little bit of hope at this time is, is greatly welcomed. And I think that's wonderful. And so we just want to wish you a happy and very healthy um, 2021. So that's my lot, Darlin. And we'll just I'll stop sharing. And we can now move to a Q&A. Lots of